Hey, quick update from Build a Soil. I wanted to talk to you today about soil testing, calcium, and greens. And the reason why I'm putting them all together is a lot of us eat greens. A lot of us that are into living soil, we also want to have really healthy food. And I was really surprised to find out that a number of plants have toxic compounds in them, even the ones that we eat from the grocery store. And so um, you could do a lot of research into the diet. There's lots of fads. Um, that, that come and go from time to time. But ultimately, if you were to go totally plant-based or you to go totally carnivore, either way you start learning a lot about plants. And the carnivore guys are saying, hey, all these plants have these compounds in them that are to stop animals from eating them. For instance, we use mustard in our soil because it creates a glucosinolate enzyme that stops animals from eating it. It's spicy, but it's beneficial to soil building because it clean, cleanses and, and fumigates most of the vegetables we eat are from the mustard family. So on one side, if you're very, very sensitive to plants, they can harm the body. Um, if you were to get dropped off into the forest somewhere, you'd be safe eating every animal, but you better know what plant you might be eating. So when it comes to gardening, I always thought, well, spinach is good, kale's good, all that stuff's really good for you. It turns out just, just like everything else in nature, um, good is in like quantity level. So if you were to have too much of a good thing, for instance, uh, spinach, chard, or beet greens every single day, smoothies and salads, you would have a very high likelihood of developing oxalates in your, in your system. And those are what creates calcium oxalate and that's kidney stones. And so um, part of that challenge is due to nutrition in the human body as well as the food. If we break it down and you don't have enough calcium in your diet and you have the oxalates, then you won't be making calcium oxalate in your intestine and the oxalate will slip by. Normally, if it makes calcium oxalate, it'll leave the system. But if there's not enough calcium, it'll slip through into the blood system and eventually make calcium oxalate elsewhere. Now, I'm not a doctor, I could keep getting some of this wrong, but ultimately, it'll pass through your urine um, into your blood system and you could get stones. So a couple ways to avoid this, some people take calcium supplements, that way if there's any oxalate, it binds, leaves the system. Um, I think it'd be better to put it up front. So, Rotate these types of greens with other family, like the mustard family is most all that we eat. So like kale and cabbage and broccoli, all those originated from the mustard plant, from selecting towards the flower or towards the leaf. And I find that fascinating on its own, right? That's a whole nother story. But the goosefoot family is known to have oxalates and it's a problem. You get into owning a lizard or reptile, it's like no nos, you can't even feed it to them. So I started questioning, well, is it really the spinach or is it the way it's grown or how does that work? And so one thing you'll be happy to find out is you can grow these plants in the goosefoot family based on Albrecht's hidden lessons to actually make the calcium available and affect the calcium digestibility in leafy greens. On page 219 in this Albrecht's hidden lesson books, I'll summarize, but he basically indicates that, I don't even need the book, I just wanted to show you. The pH and the calcium are important here. Now I find this fascinating because you'll, you'll hear that there's low pH plants. There's some flowers that they'll say you have to have a low pH to grow. And in this same book, what they found is that the plants, um, like I think it's rhododendrons, weren't really low pH lovers, but they did not like calcium. They only liked magnesium. They're magnesophiles. They love magnesium. So if you were to actually raise the pH, normally every time we raise the pH in soil, it's with calcium. So a higher pH soil full of calcium as it should be would be problematic for the rhododendrons. So growers would say, hey, if you lower the pH, it's fine. Well, lowering the pH just meant no calcium. So it took the problem out. It wasn't really the pH that did it. You can grow them healthily with magnesium all the way up to like eight pH or higher, as long as what's making that pH is magnesium. Why does that matter? Let's look back here. This is different. If we have the pH and the calcium, normally we would add lime or calcium carbonate, okay? That's what most people use, sorry, my writing's not good, to raise the pH of the soil, and that also adds calcium. So a lot of times when we're thinking, hey, we're raising the pH, back in the day, farmers would just add lime to raise the pH. They never really considered that they were feeding calcium and that made a huge difference. If you were to grow your spinach, chard, or beet greens in a typical build-a-soil recipe with high calcium, you're not going to ever be able to outpace the oxalate production with your calcium. It's just going, all the oxalate is gonna take all the calcium. You can see it while it's growing these calcium oxalate crystals on there that are terrible for you. 
However, if you're able to lower the pH and keep calcium up, which means we don't do that, we use gypsum. Gypsum can raise the pH because it's high in calcium, but apparently these prefer a gypsum-based calcium and the sulfur as opposed to the carbonate, and that helps stop the problem. The other thing is if we can get the pH low. So my thought is use of ferments. Now, I can't guarantee this will work, but Albrecht has all of it in writing and there's scientific research on it. And if we were to use ferments to constantly lower the pH of our medium, especially right in that root zone, picture an earth box with ferments added sometimes, and we used no calcium carbonate but gypsum, I believe you can grow spinach, chard, and beet greens according to Albrecht this use of the ferment to drop the pH and the use of the gypsum for the calcium will actually tip the scales so that more calcium is produced than oxalate. By the time these greens are done growing and you go to eat them, they will have more spinach than oxalate, which means that all of that will leave your system naturally and you'll actually be replenishing the body with calcium instead of taking from it for the first time. So I thought that was fascinating. And since pH is often a, a conversation that we throw out the window in living soil, um, it's more about pHing water that we threw out the window because that's for hydroponics. The pH of the soil has always been important because it's a, it's a makeup of what nutrients are in there. If you find this interesting, um, if you've got questions, let me know. I'd love to get some feedback on this. And then we're going to be setting up some earth boxes and growing them. I don't know if I can test at the lab the oxalate levels, but I'm going to look into it because lots of us like to eat healthy greens. Um, if not, you know, some vegans will eat exclusively lots of greens and then some people that eat more well um, rounded, right? They eat everything. They'll add these greens to help increase digestion, increase micronutrients. But the last thing any of us, whether we're eating straight plants or whether we're just supplementing with plants, the last thing we want to do is grow something that's so off the charts in oxalates it could be causing problems. And so I hope this is empowering for you. Um, let me know if you've got questions and I'll try and do more of these. Thanks.